Well, you've got four presentations from four quite different projects. I mean, they, they were selected really from, from dozens of applications that came in. Because there's only four, it'll be quite a quite a brief bit of time we can give to each of them. Um, but we do have the expert lounge tomorrow morning where hopefully we can continue discussion that emerges from them. So without further ado, uh, I'm just going to introduce very briefly the four speakers. Um, and I will leave them. I will leave them to present. So we've got first off uh, Dr. John Stelling and Julia Sujan. Uh, John is, I think, as I mentioned in the plenary before, um, he's the co director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance in Boston. Former medical officer with the WHO Antimicrobial Resistance Containment Unit. He leads the development of is a software called WHONET, which has been the sort of global gold standard and used by microbiology labs in over 130 countries. He's been working together with Julia Sujan, who some of us have known for quite a long time. Julius is, is from Bangladesh. He's done a lot of um, um, interoperability work, training work, and the like with, with Hispindia, with His Bangladesh, and directly with the University of Oslo. So they'll be talking about AMR. We've got a presentation on um, open MRS connectivity with DHS2 um, from Grace Popma, Pumal, Ratnayaki, and Jayasanka Wirasinghe. I think Jayasanga and Pumal will be presenting. I'm really excited to hear more about where we are with the DHIS2 connector. Um, Florian Tricklin, who is going to present again a story, I think if I have it right, of um, individual level data from the, from the periphery towards the, the, the DHIS2 at central level. Interesting project from, from Burkina Faso. Um, and finally, but not least, uh, we have Ranga, Ranga Rangari Rai Matavire, um, who's a PhD graduate from, from the University of Oslo. He's a developer, he's an intellectual, he's an entrepreneur, um, and he's the current custodian of the DHIS2 fire adapter and various innovations around that. So that's what we have ahead of us. Um, I don't know if presenters are ready to go, but we wanted to start with John and Julius. Great. Uh, this is John. Uh, can you hear me? Is the audio okay? We hear you great, John. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. And we have a short period of time, so I'll start directly. Uh, my name is John Stelling. Is, well, I've already been introduced. So I'll just dive right in. The subject is surveillance of antimicrobial resistance and integration of our WHONET software and the DHS2 software and a pilot project in Bangladesh and with my co-presenter and collaborator, Julha Sujan. So as you all know, antimicrobials were one of the most important innovations of the 20th century for providing health, for safe healthcare, curing infectious diseases, and we rely on them for so many things. But resistance is a growing threat and one of the main public health threats of the 21st century. There are many international surveillance activities, many of which do depend on the WHONET software at the, at the local facility, national, regional, and global. Here are some of the regional and global activities, most of which have some dependence on WHONET. I do want to also highlight the first one from the United Nations, the UN Interagency Coordination Group on AMR and the Global Re Leaders Group. I'd like to point out that the co-director, the co-chair of the Global Leaders Group is in fact the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, which also makes this another, another reason why Bangladesh is such an attractive pilot, as well as the very significant DHS2 expertise there. Uh, the work I'm describing is funded by the UK Department of Health and Social Care through their Fleming Fund initiative. Uh, I am part of two of the regional grants. If people would like any further information about any of these activities, feel free to contact us. Uh, we looked around for other groups working with DHIS2 and AMR integration, and these are some that we are aware of. If other people are also active, we would love to hear from you and seek opportunities for collaboration. University of Oslo and HISP India have been working on a tracker module, uh, find on an event program with the glass export. 
uh, GLASS is the WHO Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System. I mentioned that on, I showed it on the previous slide. Uh, there's an initiative in Senegal for using PATH Tracker Module for clinical reporting. And of course, uh, one of the standard WHO packages for DHIS2 or DHIS2 packages for WHO is the Tuberculosis Project, which of course includes a module for AMR. There's also an initiative for Vietnam, which started and then stopped. And one of the reasons they sto stopped were because of limitations they found in DHIS2. And I will come to a slide on that further in the presentation. So HUNET is a free software, a desktop software, not a web software that our group has been developing. In fact, we go back to the 1960s uh, with Dr. Tom O'Brien and you know, uh, the original Distiffusion. Uh, but we codified the name HUNET in 1989 as a desktop software that we've migrated over the years. Uh, currently, we support over 3,000 hospital, food, animal health, and now environmental labs in over 130 countries. The software is available in 29 languages. Uh, primarily includes a laboratory configuration module, so you configure the software the way that you would need for your local purposes. Data entry can be accomplished either by manual data entry on a day-to-day -day basis by laboratory staff out of their notebooks, or through a data import module, we have a backlink software. So if you have a lab information system, an instrument, a database, Excel, in most cases, it's possible to import those data daily, weekly, monthly, yearly into HUNET to take advantage of the analytical features of HUNET. So as one example of interoperability, uh, Bob gave some excellent points in those principles about the value of these uh, and always coming down to the use, the use case scenario, how can we provide value? So people all over the world have lab information systems with, for clinical reporting purposes, day-to-day -day operations, but without analytics. So that's where we come in to support analytics and data sharing. Data analysis, I'll mention some examples, and data exports. Uh, HUNET is our, our software and we've integrated DHIS2 in three areas. Um, one is exporting isolate level records into event program CSV files, or statistical aggregate statistics and anal analysis results into DHIS2 dataset CSV files. And whenever you export from HUNET, it, expects, it exports along the associated required XML metadata files so that you can import these into DHIS2. The exports are standardized all over the world, well, once this is rolled out, but whenever you export from HUNET, it will always create the same set of UIDs so that if you are working with this in a variety of countries, it facilitates the exchange of data among the DHIS2 databases because the UIDs are all consistent across implementations. We've implemented the export in a set of predefined standard reports. Click here, that's the that's the standard report. You do this and then go to DHIS2 and you will always get the same thing with every instance. A particularly important one is the WHO glass export. And you see in the lower right hand corner checkbox, export to DHIS2. You can also do interactive analyses with HUNET. You can now put those results to the screen, to Excel, to Access, or now DHIS2. Below that, it says configure output files where you would enter, for example, your high level uh, organization unit UID. In the future, we will also support JSON. We'll work more closely with University of Oslo, his India on their tracker module and integration and with other people who would be interested in working together. We will also look at automated synchronization of the backends. Right now, uh, DHS2 was new for us a year ago. So we're also, uh, it's a learning opportunity for us uh, to take advantage of the richness of DHS2 for bringing in our expertise and our international network on uh, microbiology laboratories. These are some examples of the output screens. You can do analyses of single antibiotics, cross resistance with two antibiotics. This is particularly useful for pharmacy studies about comparing drug A and drug B. Also quality control, do these results make sense? Multi-drug resistance tracking. Uh, this is very, we study resistance in part because of its public health importance and clinical importance, but uh, antimicrobial resistance is also a useful epidemiological marker to facilitate strain tracking and outbreak detection. On this screen, it's outbreak detection visually by looking at a graph. Here we have uh, 
high isolate alerts. HUNET is showing you things that are of clinical importance, public health importance, or quality control importance, suggesting a deficiency in laboratory practices. We also have statistical outbreak detection. We have integrated HUNET with the free SATSCAN software. You see an example here of Shigella in Argentina and in red, an outbreak that was confirmed initially by pulsed field gel electrophoresis and later by whole genome sequencing. So it's very valuable. Again, this interoperability, uh, we have put the SATSCAN batch as a module within HUNET, so the user does not need to learn the other software. Also, the glass export is an important one now as the WHO glass initiatives are getting out. So we did come across some limitations and we look forward to working with you to understand and address these. Uh, there's a lot of issues about duplicate counting. If you have one patient in January, one patient and that same patient in February, that's still one patient. Uh, so you should not be counting it multiply. Uh, with data sets and events, you end up with double counting. With Tracker, you can facilitate, you can count the number of people correctly, but it gets more complicated with antimicrobial resistance. You want first isolate per patient, per species, uh, per resistance pattern, perhaps, uh, per data stratification. So there are additional elements to how to do proper counting of events. When we're looking for outbreaks, we're looking for outbreaks in a hospital setting on those isolates that are first isolates on hospital day three or later. So there is some complexity there. Uh, people have often made mistakes in the interpretation of susceptibility test results. Uh, if you do it the easy way, you'll get most things right, but there are a lot of complexities regarding hierarchies, specimen types, diseases, and it has to be maintained over time. We're looking at working collaboratively with CLSI and UCAST to make this plug and play as much as possible. There are human breakpoints, animal breakpoints, and also epidemiological cutoff values, also known as microbiological breakpoints. Uh, HUNED and others offer, uh, with DHS2, we found a lot of wonderful things for the descriptive statistics and visualization, but for higher level analyses, uh, that's where we find that integrating with HUNED can be of great value. Uh, and I'm talking about the HUNET, the, the core functionality of DHIS2. Uh, file sizes, one month of the data from a small hospital takes uh, for us 140 kilobytes. That same uh, file in DHIS2 is 6.5 megabytes, 42,000 records instead of 622. Slow times and record limits. And these are some of the reasons why Vietnam stopped their DHS2. They had issues of performance, flexibility. They did a lot of custom programming and then they just went in a different direction. So this is important to keep in mind for further work. So no, sorry, just I'll... a warning, you're on 10 minutes. Okay, great, thank you. And I would now like to switch over uh, to my colleague, Julhas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Staley. Uh, hello, my name is Julhas Rujan. Um, in collaboration with the Communicable Disease Control Department, IDCR and drug administration. We mapped a large number of public and private hospitals for engagement and initial assessment of laboratory for antimicrobial resistance surveillance in Bangladesh. Out of this, we included 56 for on site assessments. So far, we have provided training on HUNED software over 140 microbiologists, clinicians, IT staff, and national AMR policymakers in Bangladesh. HUNET has been installed in 31 laboratories thus far. We have been collecting three years of historical laboratory data from 41 governmental and private hospitals in eight divisions across the country. <laughs> with a successful pilot, this will be sustained with prospective data collection and use as well as automation of file data processing. In terms of HUNET and DSIS2 integration pilot in Bangladesh, we have a DSIS2 pilot instance hosted in Amazon Oil Services for non-confidential data. With a successful pilot, our government, I mean DZSS, will establish an AMR dedicated DSIS2 server for both confidential and non-confidential data with automated file transfers and synchronization of HUNET and DSIS2 backend databases. Next slide, next slide, please. Julia, sorry, you're gonna to have to wrap up in about one minute. So Sorry, yeah, sure. You need to jump straight to a summary. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, we imported metadata uh, data sets and events to DSS2. The necessary metadata are available here. You can see in this screen. Next slide, please. 
next okay uh, this is the proposed architecture for the amr data visualization platform in bangladesh and in summary uh, huni it is widely used next please yeah Hunit is widely used worldwide to support local, national, regional, and global AMR surveillance initiatives. On the other hand, DSST is widely used by national authorities for surveillance and program monitoring initiatives. So, uh, this integration should support the development, implementation, monitoring, and impact evaluation in near real time of national AMR containment strategies in Bangladesh. Next, please. Yeah, we would like to thank our government partners, especially Dr. Anindra Rahman, Deputy Program Manager, and Dr. Jackie Reis Sabi, Principal Scientific Officer, IADC. Thank you all for listening. Me. Thanks very much, Julius, and, uh, and thank you, John. Uh, sorry for rushing you through that. That was really, really fascinating, and and lots of interesting questions, particularly I think around the the question of cohort counting versus head counting. Um, we might get that theme might emerge again in some of the other presentations, but otherwise we'll get a chance to take a few questions right at the end or um, in the expert lounge discussion tomorrow. Uh, can we move on to um, next presentation, which is Jayasanka and Kamal? Hi. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Let me share my screen. Yep, we're seeing it. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, so thank you very much for the quick introduction. So I'm Jason, a community developer at OpenMRS. I'm Puma, and I'm also a community developer at OpenMRS. So we are so happy to be a part of the Digital DHS annual conference. Isn't it, Puma? Yes, of course, Jason. So we have developed a module at OpenMRS2 to integrate OpenMRS with DHIS2. Without talking much, let's move into a quick demo. Let's assume that we have an OpenMRS instance in a hospital and we need to visualize COVID-19 patient data in DHIS2. Okay, now I have set up a new data set using DHIS2 to gather COVID-19 patient data. Here I have patient counts based on gender and age. I have three age groups here. There are some silly age, pardon me, just for the demo purpose. Also, I have created a new open MRS period indicator report to get the data that I need. So, the data set is to gather monthly data. If I need to visualize this data, I have to run the report at the end of each month and copy those values one by one and paste them into DHIS2. Pretty hard, huh? Here's the problem. If you have many complicated reports and numerous data sets, then the things get much worse. Here's the DHIS2 connector module that comes to the picture. This module was initially developed by GMB, then it has migrated to the OpenMRS report. Hats off to GMB for developing this extremely useful module. Using this module, you can easily push data from OpenMRS to DHIS2. Without talking much, let's move to the module. You can install this module from the module window of OpenMRS or just follow the setup instructions on the readme file. I'm going to connect the module with DHIS2 by adding the host, DHIS2 username and password. Before sending the data, we have to create a mapping. Mapping stores the relation between OpenMRS report and the DHIS2 datasets. We have to select the OpenMRS re report from the left side and the DHIS2 datasets from the right side. This page will give you a nice drag and drop UI to do the mappings with the indicators of the report and the data elements and the category option of DHIS2. Now I have created the mapping, let's try to push some data. 
In the DHIS2 dashboard, I have generated some nice little charts for my data set. As you all can see, here I don't have data for the month of September. Also, I can see it on the data entry view too. Now, let's go back to the modules front report view. Select our report and the mapping. Select the relevant open MRS location and the DHIS2 of you need. Select the month, in this case September. Also, note this peak figure change according to the period type of the data set. We are ready to go. Let's click on the send button and wait for the response. Amazing! Seems we have done it correctly. Let's go to DHIS2 and verify it. Now let's check back the month of September. Here we go. We have successfully pushed the data to DHIS2. Let's see what happened to our charts. Before that, we need to do one thing. It's updating the analytics table. Okay, let's see how it looks. Now we can see data for the month of September here. Apart from that, the module has some nice set of features. You can manage these mapping, duplicate them or delete them. Also, you can export and re-import the mapping, share them between instance, back up the DHIS2 API, so on. Another nice feature that comes with the module is the schedule option. All you have to do is schedule in the reports. The module will do the jobs for you. In that demo, you saw the things which can be done using the DHIS connector module. So, and now the now these things are we are focusing now. You may notice that uh, the user has to select the open MRS location and the DHIS to organization unit when pushing data to DHIS2. We thought to make it easier for the user. So we are going to implement a new feature called automated location mapping. With this feature, users can save the matching lo location or unit sets for the future usage. And uh, with the help of DHIS2 API, everything involving location or units would be automated. Also, we are increasing the security of this module by implementing a user access control system. Here we introduce a new role privilege based access control system. So the OpenMRS admins can assign roles and privileges to the people who handle the module. In addition, this feature can greatly reduce the common mistakes made by users. When it comes to UI UX, we keep improving the UI to provide a better user experience by making it simpler and easier. Also, we optimize the workflow of the DHIS connector module to make the processes faster. Yes, Uncle. So this, yeah, this module is also available in public. So you can easily download it by using OpenMRS add-on page. That's good news. As everything at OpenMRS, this is also is an open source module. So you can contribute to this module to make it far better. Join OpenMRS talk today and let's continue the discussion there. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us in OpenMRS talk or DHIS2 community. Also, you can have a chat with us within the conference as well. Hope you got an idea about the module. Thank you very much for listening. Write code, much. save lives. Thanks very much, guys. That, that was a really entertaining presentation. I, I, I like the musical interludes. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really cool how you seem to have fixed all of the ugliness of the old DHIS2 connector module, uh, the drag and drop interface and the like. It's exciting to see where it's got to. Um, and I know there's a huge amount of interest in DHIS2 open MRS interoperability, more particularly again recently. So yeah, wish you all the best with 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 um, the continued development of it, and thanks for sticking on time. Thank you very much, Bob. So Thank you very much. now we have um, Florian, Florian Triplin. Florian, are you ready to roll? Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you, Bob. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me? We hear you. Good. And can you see me now? It's okay. Can you see my screen? Yep, all good. 
Thanks. So hello everyone, my name is Florian Triclin, and I'm really pleased to present uh, YEDA, the Digital Health Approach of Terre des Hommes, uh, and its complementarity with ENDOS, uh, the Hills Data Warehouse of Burkina Faso, which is uh, based on uh, a DHIS2 instance. Uh, in a few words, Terre des Hommes is uh, the main uh, organization uh, for children in Switzerland. It is present in 35 countries um, around the world and had 4.8 million, million beneficiaries in, uh, in 2020. In West Africa, Terre des Hommes is present in Mauritania, Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Nigeria in three main areas, uh, which are uh, access to justice, migration, and health. In the health sector, um, TDH focuses mainly on three priorities, maternal, newborn, and child health, strengthening of the, of the health uh, system, um, and uh, digital health, which is transversal to the, to the first two. In terms of digital health, uh, Terdesum has co-created since uh, 2010, uh, with the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso, a digital health approach whose uh, primary objective is to improve the quality of care uh, at the peripheral level. This approach is based on four pillars. The first is uh, a digital tool, which is called the REC, for uh, Registre Electronique de Consultation in French, which, which is Electronic Consultation Register. Uh, which I will come back uh, after. The second pillar concerns the analysis and the exploitation of data resulting from the use of, of the tool. The third pillar, which is largely responsible for the success of the, of the approach, is um, uh, coaching at the peripheral level, which aims to improve the overall level of competence of health workers. The fourth pillar is uh, e-learning, through a platform that links health workers to training modules. In Burkina Faso, the, the IMCI for, for children under five years of age uh, was digitized in 2010 and implemented on the tablets made available in the, in the health centers. In this representation of the Burkina Faso Health System, we, we see that YEDA is now composed of several tools at the bottom of the slide. The REC IMCI, but also a REC maternity composed of five forms, prenatal care, delivery, postnatal care, family planning, and post-abortion care. Two other tools complete the suite at the peripheral level, an EMR for those over five years of age, and a stock management tool. As we will see later, all these tools are fully, integ fully integrated into the country's IT infrastructure. The IMCI, the REC, let's say the, the REC for Registre Electronique de Consultation, for IMCI within the IEDA approach is at scale uh, in Burkina Faso and currently covers nearly 85% of the country's health centers. Full coverage will probably be reached um, by the end of this year or probably early next, next year. The REC records an average of 250,000 consultations per month. It contains more than 10 million consultations for five, children, five, five million children, sorry. So this scale-up is leading to a transfer process that we are currently carrying out to the Ministry of Health. And we hope to carry out equivalent scales up in India, Mali and Niger where we are currently conducting pilots. The, the diagnostic tool allows health workers to refine the analysis of symptoms and improve diagnosis and treatment through an algorithm that interacts, interacts with the health worker. The data is entered into the, the tool progressively by agents who are attentive to the patient. Regular checks are made on the data entered thanks to machine learning algorithms. All these elements contribute to the capture of highly reliable data, not to mention the significant improvements in classification, 
in the case of the IMCI, and diagnosis that the tool has brought about. It is also worth noting the, the, the short time frame in which these data are made available. Indeed, the tablets containing the REC regularly synchronize their data with, this, with the central platform based in Comcare technology, where 3G coverage exists. Statistics shows that more than 60% of PhDs upload their data in less than a week. This value increases to more than 97% in less than a month. So yet yeah, data is prompt and highly available. Sorry, finally, uh, one last point regarding the, the, the YEDA data in the districts and PHCs where the YEDA approach is strongly applied. Almost all consultations are carried, carried out with the tool. The data are therefore very complete. The fact that YEDA is at scale represents an, an additional incentive for district management teams and his workers to adopt the approach. The YEDA data are therefore highly reliable available in a very short time and have a high level of completeness. I would now like to spend a few minutes on the process of aggregating and collecting the health data that we typically find in, in, in our health care settings. So in Burkina Faso, uh, Burkina Faso is no exception to this rule. In general, consultations are recorded manually in a register kept in the health centers. This register is the source of the monthly reports prepared by the head nurses, which are then transmitted to the district. In Burkina Faso, there is a decentralized data entry pilot in DHIS2, thanks to the capture application deployed on the YEDA tablets. Whether the data is entered in a paper report or in capture, the aggregation operation in the register is manual, as is the data in trial. The data that reaches the district is then analyzed and validated by the district, district management team in DHIS2 to fit the country's decision-making dashboards. YEDA's primary goal is to improve the quality of care, but it is clear that the value of such a system also lies in its ability to replace manual data in trial for monthly reporting by aggregating and transmitting the data collected during consultations in an automated manner. There is then very little to do for this aggregated data to be automatically transferred to the DHIS2. The MOTEC module performed this function by converting the ComCare forms into DHIS2 events. Through this association between YEDA and DHIS2, so we quickly understand the complementarity of these two tools and the advantages of integrating a CDSA like YEDA from the design of a national health information system. CDSA data are exploited and constitute an extremely reliable prompt and complete source for the decision-making tools used at the central level. Health worker can focus on patient care they save valuable time and health centers save money that they can reinvest in the medical equipment essential to their work. YEDA is a rare example of a digital health tool scaled up in West Africa that is fully integrated into the, the country's health infrastructure, improving the quality of patient care while improving the quality of the data that underpins the ministry's decisions. Thank you. The floor is you, Bob. Thanks, Florian. That's a really interesting presentation. Um, I think there'd be lots of questions people might be interested to ask. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time towards the end. I'm particularly interested in, in the handover process, which you say is, is due to happen now in 2021. Um, but yeah. Let's move straight over to Ranga and um, let's see if we get a little bit of time at the end. Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Bob. Um, 
I'm going to present on uh, the work we've been doing with the DHIS to fire that. Uh, I think you can see presentation, right? Uh, uh, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, I see it. Okay. So basically, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, DHIS2 and fire and uh, some of the progress that has been made within the community in implementing um, uh, the DHIS2 fire adapter, which is a very interesting component within this um, architecture. So I'll just uh, get straight uh, to the point. Uh, I've got many screens here. Can you see the next screen? Closing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So okay. Basically, the background is uh, is this is kind of uh, um, the architecture of the system if you want to think of it that way. So there's a set of um, Android applications that we developed. The first one we call Register, which is basically for patient identifiable information. Then the second one is what we call Freezen Clinic App, which is basically the, the point of care system at the facility where clients are met. And the other one is uh, internal referral for doing internal referrals or referrals from internally in an organization to other facilities that are outside than an external referral for referring clients inside. So that's kind of uh, at least the user interface aspect. What is interesting is that all these apps, they are basically customized on DHIS2. Then uh, that's kind of the interoperability aspects of the apps themselves with DHIS2, but also in terms of sending data, we customize on DHIS2. That means the metadata is created on DHIS2, but we don't send data directly to DHIS2. Within our app, uh, we now have to send the data to a fire server. And also we have uh, been implementing um, Epifier, which is one of the largest fire implementations. Mm -hmm. So then this is um, kind of uh, the picture. Uh, the Android app, uh, which is Freezen, uh, which is basically a suit of apps. And then we have the fire um, layer, and uh, we have DHS to fire adapter and DHS to. So initially, when you log on, the system goes through and gets uh, metadata from DHS2 to, to set up forms and all that on the mo mobile phones, depending on which app you're using. Then um, having done that, um, uh, you capture your records, then they go through fire, uh, the fire server, then through the DHS fire adapter and back to DHS2. So um, uh, basically, in terms of the Android apps and socks, that's a screenshot from, from the app. Uh, but basically, it's an Android, it's a native Android application. So it's, it's not really flexible to move to other platforms. And we basically used native Android features and libraries. So that makes our system quite easy to set up on, on distribution platforms like Google Cloud and all that. Then it's full offline capabilities. Um, on the app, that means once you log in for the first time, you're offline also, because it uses DHS to auth tool, you don't need to enter your password again. So all transactions with the system are, are through auth tool. Then it's fire compliant, um, the Android app itself. So basically what it does, it takes DHS metadata, then it converts it into a fire compliant uh, format. Then it's the person who's entering data is basically entering fire compliant data. Then multi-user support, you can have multiple users using the same device. Once you log in, you just need a pin. So you can have five, six users just entering the pins to log back in to continue. So also because of offline capabilities, the unavailability of internet in some of these countries with Bluetooth to exchange data offline. Then we have biometric referral system that, you know, somebody can enter their fingerprint uh, when you're referring. The referral is created using a fingerprint, then it's received on the other hand using a fingerprint as well. So you cannot access the referral data if the person does not bring their fingerprint. So then when you say interoperable with DHS2, we mean that we customize using DHS2 tracker. Then we also build on top of the DHS2 authentication layer. So we basically use DHS2 auth to authentication and even to authenticate to our fire servers. Then what uh, is critical also is that we, we also run the DHS2 program rules on the app. So basically, if you create program rules in DHS2 on the app, they will run on the system. 
Then also it's, it supports a pretty large database because we are our client who we are currently working with is uh, maybe 80,000 patients at a time. So it can be quite big in terms of uh, the amount of data that is accessible from the mobile device in an offline manner. So having said that, uh, uh, this is basically the mapping that we did from DHS to FHIR, or what you call a tracked entity type in DHS2. It could be a resource and, you know, DHS2 tracked entity types, you never know what they are, are they person, are they, um, it could be anything a well, DHS2 can track basically anything, right? So in this case, we have to specify what we're tracking. So in Fireside, we have to know that we're tracking a patient, I was tracking a referral, I was tracking something else. So we have to specify. So in terms of the fields, DHS2, we call them track identity attributes. Uh, on the Fireside, we specify, we link to the Fireside using what's called Firepath. So basically we, we decorate uh, DHS2 attributes with Firepath space. Um, compliant um, metadata so that we know that, okay, this name is actually a patient name or this field is actually a surname or this is a contact or this is a phone number. So we do the mapping on the DHS2 side. Then of course, in terms of clinical decision support on the DHS2 side, we program rules in terms of fire. We talk about clinical quality language. This is the direction that we're going now, but we haven't fully implemented secure. Then enrollment, in DHS2 enrollment the program, on the fire side, we map that program into what's called a care plan. Then of course, what you call an event in DHS2 is an activity in a care plan on fire. Data, what you call a data element in DHS2 can be directly mapped to a questionnaire response on the fire side. Uh, but also that's just a generic approach to customization. There are many ways in which to, to dig deep into the fire standards and um, so on and so forth. So then of course, indicator in DHS2 is what's called a measure in fire. So in terms of how you specify DHS2 system, you probably need to have a data indicator dictionary of some sort. In fire, you use what are called profiles. So we've done all this mapping in the background. So the system just connects from one side to the other. Then having said that, uh, our current application, application of the system is uh, the sex work program in Zimbabwe, which is um, 80,000 highly mobile clients uh, cross-border. Is that the spelling of border? I'm not sure. But uh, cross-border, you know, they travel a lot and you need to track. There are many legacy systems for the clients we've been working with. And for example, what's called Coconut, they've also been using ODK. So we basically integrated all those different systems into one system, which is fire and DHS2 compliant. Then of course, we've conducted a piloting and we have fixed the bugs reported in the pilots. And now they're just verifying the data to make sure because there's been quite a lot of legacy information. So that's uh, that side of things. And uh, the DHS to fire adapter is working, moving data from between DHS to and fire, as you can see. So we also have a component called the migrator, which basically takes data from their pre-existing systems into DHS2, into Epifier, then from Epifier through the adapter to DHS2. So, I mean, um, we want, uh, we've been we've been using questionnaires a lot because they map easily to DHS2 kind of questionnaires, but also want to go deeper into us, start using other types of resources. We've started using other resources on fire, such as what's called service requests. And um, we are basically developing the DHS2 fire adapter to accommodate more resources which are fire compliant. Then of course, we've also been participating and working with uh, a team in WHO, which has uh, been working on what they call computer or care guidelines. So in this uh, forum, uh, uh, there is, we're participating in, in, in the project to develop what's called an Android Fire SDK, which will limit because originally we wrote our own Fire SDK within our Android apps. So the, the teams, Google and other stakeholders are writing a new Fire SDK, which can be used across different Android apps and it is by default compliant with Fire. So that's what we'll be using. And also it's easy for you to receive what are called computable care guidelines, which will be distributed by WHO, which will just run on the Android app. Then you have a fire compliant implementation by just doing that. Of course, we're also working on improving the DHS to fire adapter. There's a lot of work to be done there, uh, but so far is we're, we're using it as it is, but there are main ideas in terms of how to automate it, how to make it easier to use. A lot of people try to use the fire adapter end up uh, coming to us and facing some challenges and maybe giving up along the way. So hopefully in the process, we we improve uh, that um, applicability of that fire adapter on the DHS to site. And of course, we're working on integration of secure 
uh, between, um, so basically once we start using the Android Fire SDK, which is under development, secure is built in. So we won't necessarily need, for example, to run the DHS2 program engine within our system. So, I mean, um, basically, so the different partners that have been participating in this project, it's in West of Oslo. We've also been supported by Innovation Norway. Session in Zimbabwe has been a key stakeholder in terms of development and requirements. Then, of course, we, like we said, we're participating in the Computer Bouquet Guidelines Working Groups, which are Google and WHO way we're developing, participating in the development of um, standards and distributable fire. Um, guidelines basically then of course the team within our own uh, company so i mean uh, there's a lot in terms of um, uh, the fire system but i can just uh, for one minute show you exactly a little bit so this is what it looks like on the fire side in the background um, and uh, these are these are cape land like you said it's a program in dhs2 then uh, okay, you, you you have about a minute or two okay okay so basically, if if uh, let me just hide floating meeting controls here. And so you can look, for example, on the DHIS2 side, if you look at a program, it looks something like this, right? Where you can add um, stages, for example, in this case, you can add demographic details, so on and so forth. Then in this case, if you look at the same design on the fire side, it's what's called a K plan. So basically each stage in DHIS2 will be like an activity. So this is a planned activity for the client. So for example, this is demographic details and other activities. So this is what it looks like on the fire side. Then uh, on the um, this one, on the Android side, uh, this is what, for example, the system would look like on Android. So that my device looked. So for example, that's the Android device and um, basically the program is customized in data as to so that's what it looks like. You have program rule support from the HS2. And uh, you can uh, enter, basically this entire customization is done on the HS2. So you can enter whatever data sections, whatever it is that you're collecting in the field. So thanks, this- Thanks, Ranga. I, I think we're gonna have to wrap up. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm done. So that's basically it in terms of um, the system that we have been working on. And basically it's, it, it builds on top of the DHS to fire adapter, and we're developing and improving the adapter to accommodate more use cases. Thank you, Bob. Excellent, thanks, Donna. That was really, really fascinating. I mean, I have two things. I think, first of all, the the work that's been done now on the resource mapping. You know, moving moving beyond questionnaire questionnaire response to more to strongly typed mapping of resources. I think that's a huge advance. And I was really interested to see what's going to happen with the CQL work and whether there can be any way of linking that with program rules and stuff in DHS too. But thanks for the presentation, Raga. And 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 again, thanks, thanks for being on time. And because yeah. everybody's been so disciplined, we've actually got, I think, five minutes yeah. to field one or two questions to any of the presenters um, before we get kicked out of here. Max, I don't know how it goes. Will we, will we be kicked out in five minutes or 10 minutes? Uh, it'll be kicked out in six, seven, eight minutes, definitely. We have another session starting here at All right. three o'clock. Good, so we've got six, seven minutes. Has, if anybody got a question they want to pose to the to any one of the four presenters, fire now. <laughs> fire now. Or will we fish from the chat? <laughs> So just reading up, it's, um, we have Richard Mitchell asking Ranga. That was interesting. They do you have a, you say you've set up three fire resources so far. How many more do you anticipate mapping? I mean, uh, we are not using three fire resources. We're using, let me just look at the fire one, organization, location, media, episode of care, patient, questionnaire response, service request, care plan, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, eight fire resources. We use service request for our referral system. We use media because we have a uh, fingerprint system. So we're using the media resource to store some, some, some uh, encrypted um, uh, basically fingerprint data for the clients. And um, care for 
an encounter when you enroll into a facility, it's an episode of care. So whatever enrollment, you get an episode of care. So it's, it's seven, eight resources, and we're planning to use more <laughs> in the near future. Okay. Does anybody have a question for one of the earlier presenters? I've just been working up through the chat, and I'm sure people have been putting them on the community of practice. If somebody wants to say something, just put it in the chat here and we'll get it. Otherwise, what I will say, you know, we have the experts lounge tomorrow morning, or noon, I think it is, um, around interoperability, and hopefully the presenters from this session, as well as 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 others, will be will be available in there as well for any additional clarifications or discussions. I feel bad. I rushed everybody along, and we now have three minutes to go. Bob, you had a question on the handover process, I think, in Burkina Faso, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm interested to know how, when is that going to happen, and how has the preparation been, and how do you see that going? Because the handover process is is always fraught with difficulty. Yeah, it's a long journey. Um for this handover process. And we are present in 85%, as I said, in uh, uh, of the PhDs in Burkina Faso. So um, the, the, the whole, we, we are transferring the whole approach. So, I mean, uh, the tool, of course, but also uh, coaching processes, uh, uh, data analyze, uh, e-learning, etc. So this is, uh, a long journey of two years, let's say, uh, and it's not finished. Um, the main difficulties is uh, to, try to to be sure that there is, uh, of course, competencies uh, uh, in Burkina Faso, but also and, and more uh, organization uh, for to receive this. Uh, there is an infrastructure that that can uh, host. Uh, come care instance and data and so on. So there is no uh, really uh, technical issue regarding that, but more uh, organization of the, the agency that is uh, that is hosting the, this platform and uh, all the processes uh, of coaching that we have developed, of course, uh, to be sure that the tool is well used because we know that if there is no the whole approach, and the, the, the whole process uh, around the, the, the usage of the tool, uh, there is no usage of the tool <laughs> and, and can make a cross on Yeda. So uh, yes, this is a really complicated process, but we are sure that we will keep a link with the DHIS to this is a set. <laughs> uh, we are sure of that. Oh, good. Well, we look forward to watching it. I'm, I'm sure the HISP WCA people are probably more familiar with that particular project. Um, I mean, with DHS, two implementations typically, we've tried to avoid this notion of, of a can turnkey projects with a handover because they are so fraught with difficulty. And the tendency to try to evolve, I guess, the eventual system owners from the very, very beginnings of the system implementation and design, so that the, the transition is kind of less traumatic. But um, it's good to hear that you have at least the, the, the technical parts of infrastructure support and the like under control. That's a big one. I think we might have to wrap up so we can prepare the next presentations. Oh, okay, so we have to wrap up here. So thanks very much, first of all, to the presenters. Excellent presentations, really interesting. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for attending. And um, let's hope towards, maybe we'll have a bigger interoperability webinar or something towards the end of the year. We can have a little bit more time.